Well, thank you very much. And uh, just as a reminder, we're, we're here till 9 o'clock. But between now and then, we're going to hear a very interesting talk from Barry Podolsky. Now, fortunately, Barry needs no introduction. However, as president of Heritage Ottawa, I, I do feel entitled to introduce him. He's an honorary life member of Heritage Ottawa. He was co-chair back in 1972 of the campaign to s try to save the Rideau Convent. Uh, we didn't save the convent, but we saved the chapel, and it's been beautifully re-erected in the National Gallery. Unfortunately, not open to view this week, but <laughs> come back and see it sometime. Uh, Barry, originally from uh, Manitoba, uh, but studied in Edinburgh. Uh, a, a resume as long as your arm or longer, uh, but he is not only an architect and an urban planner, a teacher, a writer, a lecturer, an expert witness, a juror in uh, architectural heritage competitions, uh, and many other things. His name is associated with almost every important project that you've been hearing about during this conference. Uh, to mention only three, the Global Pluralism Center, the National Arts Center renovation, uh, and of course this wonderful building that we're in tonight. Uh, his awards, uh, again, are a very long list, including uh, a Massey Medal uh, and many, many uh, architectural excellence awards. Uh, I'm not going to go into any more detail because it's Barry who's going to tell you about what it is he does and what he has done and the many things I hope that he's still planning to do. So I'm going to ask Barry to come up now. Uh, you will be having your dessert and coffee, hopefully not too noisily. We've turned off the music in the back, thank goodness. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. So, Barry. Thank you, David. And uh, yes, feel free to enjoy your dessert and coffee, and uh, I'll be up here envying you. Uh, I'm really, really... Uh, grateful to be invited to speak to you tonight and in particular sitting as we are in the Victoria Memorial Museum uh, national monument and landmark and one in which uh, over a number of years I had the privilege with my colleagues um, Bruce Kurabara and uh, Daniel Atelius here from Quebec City the joint venture team that worked for eight years to renovate this building in between 19, uh, 2002 and 2010. What I'm going to do without much more introduction to myself, because I, the only thing I would uh, say is that I don't consider myself to be from Manitoba, but from the north end of Winnipeg, which is a city-state all by itself. And those of you from Winnipeg will know that. Um, the the Museum of Nature, housed in the Victoria Memorial Museum, is uh, a major Canadian iconic uh, institution and landmark in the capital. And I thought that I would tell you a little bit about its history. You probably know a lot about it. Uh, some of the first uh, glimpses of its history I learned in reading Sally Coots's Febro report when we were first appointed to do the building and that inspired me to continue to the research as we went through the renovation of this building. And what I just wanted to be able to share with you is that Canada, you know, after Confederation, uh, a country that was welcoming immigrants that was being explored for its natural resources and uh, being, in a sense, a new dominion, didn't have all that much re real sense that it had parted from you know, the mother country or the mother countries. And at the time, the whole idea of uh, creating a national identity to distinguish ourselves from our neighbors to the south and the Europeans was to uh, build a capital, and particularly Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who, when he was elected the, uh, with the Liberal Party in 1896, was committed to the idea of 
creating a Washington of the North up here in, in the wilderness among the black flies and the lumber. And part of that was to create a, um, a capital that expressed Canadian identity and architecture that would, uh, that, that would be distinctive from America, distinctive from Europe, and th the idea of having a, uh, a national museum uh, was a kind of mark of our coming of age and a mark of our sense of who we were. And I was always trying to think of, you know, what would be a contemporary parallel of uh, sense of identity. It's like, um, you know, all the cities want to have an NHL franchise. And if you don't have an NHL franchise in your city, like, who are you? And I think that in that respect, Museums were being built uh, all over uh, Europe and in America, and we wanted to have our museum as well. So the Victoria Museum was it. And um, of course, in 1901, uh, the government of Canada did resolve to build this showcase. And it wasn't just a, a building, it was about uh, our intellectual achievements, you know, a museum of for the Geological Survey of Canada that we may have forgotten about as the original users of the building. And uh, at the time, of course, exploring the country, the uh, whole field of geology, uh, geography, our natural history, uh, paleontology, let's not forget the discovery of the dinosaurs, seismology and anthropology, these were the areas that scientists spread out across the country and the uh, collections that they were finding were to be housed here in the museum. So one of the things the government had to do was to choose a place where do you put the museum. And the debate in Parliament initially was to locate it uh, at uh, Nepean Point or at Majors Hill Park, that area, but eventually they chose a site that was one mile south of Parliament Hill, and here's a, a 1876 Brosius drawing which shows the location of a place called Appen Place. This was the estate of uh, a very wealthy family, the McLeod Stewarts. Uh, McLeod Stewart was a mayor of Ottawa, and uh, the resolution to purchase that property was passed by Parliament, and they spent uh, $75,000 to buy this site, you know, a nine-acre site. But even at that time, they were very careful not to overspend. And so they had four land appraisers appraising the land, and they averaged the amount, and that was the amount that they eventually paid. Of course, and this is something that really interests me, at the time, there was great regret that the, uh, the Appen Place mansion was going to be demolished. So the heritage movement started, you know, in 1903, 1904, in this city, and uh, the regrets about the loss of, uh, of Appen Place were uh, things that the cognoscenti of the city, I guess those of us that are uh, heritage advocates, would have fought at the time to save the house. The architect that was appointed to design the new museum was, of course, David Ewart, the Dominion architect at the time. He was born in Scotland, and uh, he had a, an illustrious career. In 1901, they sent him to Europe to study the new museums and to bring back great ideas that could be applied to our Victoria Museum. And, of course, Victoria Museum, because in 1901, Victoria, Queen Victoria had just died, and this was a, a landmark in her honour. Um, under, not many of us remember this, but under Ewart's uh, era of being the chief architect, this was a very, very busy uh, small office that he ran, a public office that uh, was responsible for uh, over 340 buildings across the country. And a little bit to the envy of the private architects at the time, as you will find. But uh, 
the kind of buildings that uh, you were designed uh, and his and his office, the Dominion Observatory, which I hope those of you that don't know it will go over to the experimental farm and visit it, uh, the uh, Dominion Archives building, which is today the global center of pluralism, and of course the Mint, and you'll notice as I show you these slides that they're designed in a Tudor Gothic style, very baronial, and uh, he was very much wanting to put his stamp on a language for the buildings, including uh, those as far as Vancouver. And uh, then, of course, the, the Connet building that when you're wandering around Majors Hill Park, you can, you can see. Now, you were, of course, didn't come to this country without being influenced in his architectural studies. And here are some examples of buildings in Britain that clearly influenced Ewart Hampton Court, you know, a Tudor, uh, Tudor building. You can recognize the battlements, uh, very much a, a castle, uh, which is, of course, what it was. And Ewart studied in Edinburgh, the place which I studied it as well in a much later period. And St. Giles uh, Church uh, in Edinburgh is interesting. If you look at the tower, the open crown, and that was a, uh, a landmark feature that you'll see you were tried to include in the original design of the Museum of Nature. Windsor Castle, the State Apartments, you can see when you walk around this uh, museum, you can very much recognize some of the features, the Tudor Gothic windows, the, the battlements, the symmetry. And then, curiously, um, the... Uh, the British market cross with the open crowns, something that never got built on this building, but you were aspired to do it. And of course, the Victorian Albert Museum, which was one of the buildings that was in the process of being designed at the time that you went to see when he went to, uh, to Britain. Here's an interesting um, drawing which I uh, came across. It was the competition entry for the Smithsonian Museum in 1846 by John Notman. And if you look at this, you can pretty well see uh, the design that you were proposed for the Victoria Museum. And so here we are, his initial design, the initial drawings for the museum, a Beaux-Arts composition, very symmetrical, with a central tower in a Tudor Gothic style. You would call this free Gothic. It was his term that he used to describe his, his style. Uh, and this is the main north elevation of the building. And uh, one of the things that we are never able to escape is the uh, admiration or the criticism of our, of our peers. And at the time, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada thought that the Tudor Gothic design was very backward looking. Like, let's do something really modern, like something classical. Classical is modern. So by doing a Tudor Gothic building, uh, he was not very popular. A glorified packing box, it was called. And the same thing with the Connet building. Uh, the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada, which I am a member, uh, called it a puerile design and questionable construction. Part of the reason, I think, I have to admit, is that there was a certain amount of envy among the architectural community because Ewart and the chief architects branch were getting all the federal work. And so they were working very hard to try to undermine the chief architects' uh, work and get more work for the private architects. That's what we do. So Ewart, uh, you can see, uh, had a vision for the design of the building. What you see on the left is the uh, Victoria Tower of the, central, uh, of the center block of Parliament with, if you look very carefully, its open crown at the top. And the museum with its tower was going to be a, um, a companion of that at the other end of the great axis of, of Metcalf Street. So here's the plan of the building, very symmetrical, uh, looking at it from the north towards the south. And if you look at the curved apse 
which is the salon just below us here, you'll see that it is bracketing the parliamentary library at the north end. So you have this long Beaux-Arts axis between Parliament and uh, the Victoria Museum with a curve at each end. And you might think about that when you walk down Metcalf Street. A lot of uh, drawings that show the details. Not as many drawings as we had to do when we did the renovations. I think that Ewart's architecture drawings, there were about 22 drawings. I think that between 2000 and 2 and 2010, we maybe did 2,000 drawings. That says something about it. So there was a tendering process, and uh, the contract for the museum was awarded to a George Goodwin, a major builder, for the sum of $950,000. Here's the building under construction. Uh, obviously, a lot of stone, and for that, they had to also have uh, stone masons, and they apparently imported 500 or 300 Scottish stone masons to uh, to build uh, this building. One of the things that you might notice when you walk around the exterior of the building is that there are several types of stone. There is a Nepean sandstone, which is which is quarried regionally and then the Wallace sandstone from Wallace, Nova Scotia, that is the fine stone for carving. So the building went up, and uh, in completed in 1911, a uh, marvelous landmark uh, in its nine-acre park, an Edwardian park with diagonal uh, walks, and uh, the trees were still quite small. But the view, as you went from Parliament up Metcalf Street with the axial tower at the end was beckoning and quite a marvelous example of uh, Beaux-Arts design as you approached it. The whole idea of an entry sequence, almost like a sacred procession coming to the building with its, with its tower and then the entrance through the, through the lobby and into the atrium which you all went through when you arrived, the idea of a dark um, sort of gothic entrance area then opening up into uh, a wonderful space full of light. Um, the idea of the natural light being a metaphor for um, education, for enlightenment. This was really what the museum was aiming to do. Some of the views of the interior, and of course, the key to it all were the exhibits. The geology, you know, showcasing Canada's vast mineral wealth, uh, the discoveries of, uh, of dinosaurs, and uh, also collecting the mammals and uh, of, of the country. Uh, they had a little problem you know, stacking them all away, and exhibits for uh, children, for everyone, because this was the period of the rise of public education and uh, the whole idea of learning through museum work. And of course, the First Nations, uh, the uh, social anthropology portion of it. And of course, in this building, we also had the National Gallery of Canada, so it was a kind of condominium of museums. And uh, the library, of course, a place for, for research, all these wonderful spaces. And if, then the auditorium where lectures could be held, and, uh, and so they did. As you all know, on February 3rd, 1916, there was a fire on Parliament Hill. It was feared that uh, this may have been the work of uh, German espionage, but it turned out not to be. But one of the things that we learned here was that the moment that, even while the, the building was burning, both the House of Commons and the Senate decided that they would vacate the museum and move into this museum as, uh, as Parliament. And they did this, are you ready for this, in 24 hours. Governments can work fast when they really want to. And so here's, you know, the... Uh, Parliament in session in the auditorium 
Sir Wilfrid Laurier speaking there, and they stayed there until uh, 1919. Um, it, it, what can we learn from the Museum of, of Nature, Natural History? One of the things that I learned early on was that the museum was built on 40 meters of Lita clay. Lita clay, of course, was laid down after the glaciers retreated from North America and in pockets like the Centertown area of Ottawa, you had uh, uh, the, the, the silty clay, which was not a great thing to build on. And one of the things that uh, the contractor George Goodwin and the workers noticed as the stone was just rising above the ground is that the building was sinking. And in fact, uh, over the first decade, the building sank half a meter. So you all would be a half a meter taller had this building not sank. And uh, what they had to do was to uh, take the tower down. 80 feet of this stone tower had to be removed because it was leaning to the north uh, towards Parliament Hill and it was a safety hazard, so they took it down. It's a cautionary tale and one of the things that I was very curious about was um, could David Ewart and his engineers have been more prudent? And we have some structural engineers with us tonight and I know that they're paying attention at this point, particularly Dan Carson, who was the structural engineer on this project. And one of the things that uh, my curiosity about this uh, phenomenon was it led me to do a little bit of research. Um, Chicago World's Fair, 1893. What th does that have to do with the Victoria Museum here in Ottawa? Well, this was the m Great Columbian Exhibition, and it was the place in the world that everybody was w destined to, and uh, it was an example of Beaux-Arts planning, the Great White City, and it showed the achievements of America and other countries in the science and agriculture um, entertainment, including the Ferris wheel. When they were uh, planning the 1893 World's Fair, they were still remembering the 1889 World's Fair in Paris, where the Eiffel Tower was built, and they wondered, what, how can we out Eiffel Eiffel? And of course, the Ferris wheel was their answer to it. Uh, Canada's position at the World Fair, one of the most popular exhibits apparently, was the mammoth cheese. You all heard about the mammoth cheese from Perth, Ontario. Who's from Perth here? Everybody knows Perth. Yeah. Anyway, the mammoth cheese was one of the hits of the exhibition. And uh, the exhibition was built on uh, swampy soils and uh, but in Chicago, the clever architects and engineers there, in particular the, some of the pioneers like Wellbone Root in, the, the, in 1882, developed the idea of the raft slab. Now I know this might be a little technical for some, and you say, well, how does this relate to the Museum of Nature, the Victoria Museum? Um, the raft slab was a very, very marvelous innovation in order to support heavy and tall buildings on the swampy soils. And uh, what I did learn through a little bit of research is that chief architect of uh, public works, the Dominion architect, David Ewart, visited the Chicago World's Fair six times in 1892 and 1893. And so my question was, did he not talk with Daniel Burnham? Did he not talk with the architects there about building on swampy soils? That's something I'm leaving to researchers that would like to pursue this question about um, the state of knowledge of building on swampy soils at the time. Why was David Ewart going to the fair six times? Well, Canada had a pavilion. They not only had the mammoth cheese, but they had this wonderful Beaux-Arts pavilion that showcased some of uh, uh, Canada's achievements. And David Ewart was the architect. So back to uh, our Victoria Museum. between. 1919 and 1950, it was known as the, the sinking castle for 
obvious reasons. There were rumors that the chief architect had thrown himself from the tower and killed himself because he was so disappointed, but that is just a rumor. Uh, the place apparently is still haunted. I don't think it's Ewart's ghost, but it may be somebody else. In 1950, um, there was a master plan for the capital commissioned by uh, Mackenzie King and Jacques Rebert, the Parisian planner. Uh, he recommended that this museum, the Victoria Museum, should be abandoned. That it was, uh, you know, beyond repair. And one of the things that he wrote in his report was that um, this building, uh, poorly designed for exhibits, and its present poor structural condition, um, you know, deserves to be uh, abandoned. And uh, at the time, 1952, the government then moved to take one part of the museum, the National Gallery, and move it out. Uh, they had a design competition. The competition was cancelled, and but the gallery was moved temporarily into the Lorne Building on Elgin Street, uh, a building that you see there. Eventually, it found a permanent home in the National Gallery by Moshe Safdie. This was the the new museum that was to be in Confederation Square to replace the Victoria Museum, it too wasn't built. Once the decision was made not to build that new museum, then the government decided to invest in this building somewhat. So between 1969 and 74, um, they began to modernize the building so that it could be better used with some partial modernizations. Uh, eventually, the Museum of Man, now uh, civilization, now uh, Canadian history, moved out, leaving the building entirely to uh, the Museum of Nature. In 93 to 97, uh, my firm, along with Suter Kellers, some engineers, were invited to begin the serious conservation of the building envelope, which had been neglected. And I won't go into the details of what this was, but it was a four your period of making sure that the whole building, the stonework, the windows, the roof were all stable so that one day they could renovate the museum. Uh, this photograph shows uh, an, a young Barry Podolsky uh, in Wallace, Nova Scotia, helping to pick out the stone for the new building. Then, finally, the government decided in uh, 2001 to finally renovate this national landmark. And the objectives, and I hope I don't bore you with this one, but it was to conserve and restore the building's heritage character, to adapt the building to meet the contemporary needs of a museum. Museum needs changed over the decades, and they did a lot of research about it. One of the other things was to be able to showcase the museum's exhibits in a way that was safe. What does that actually mean? Well, a lot of the collection really requires environmental conditions, museum conditions, and the dilemma would be that if you created the temperature and humidity as we have in this room for uh, artifacts like us, the same conditions would destroy the exterior walls of the building because they can't take that kind of thing, particularly in the winter. They also wanted to enrich the visitor experience, increase attendance, and make the museum more inviting, inviting and accessible, and uh, to make it more environmentally responsible. After all, this is the Museum of Nature. It's connecting people with, with nature. And to resolve some of the planning issues, and then, if that wasn't enough, to keep the building open during construction. This was a, uh, a real challenge, and of course, last but not least, adhering to the, the budget and the schedule. An example of why they had to ha make changes, this is how uh, exhibits used to be brought in to the museum through the front door. We were lucky enough, when I say we, the consulting team um, was appointed, and I'd just like to credit here the fact that it takes a whole village to do a project of this nature and this scale. Um, the prime consultants were a joint venture between my firm, Kurpara, Payne, McKenna, Bloomberg, 
and Gagnon Latelius here of Quebec City. PCL was the construction manager. This is not an advertisement, but it's telling you that uh, there had to be an enormous group to do a project like this. Our heritage conservation approach was minimum intervention, except to be able to adapt the building for the aggressive changes that it needed in order to be a modern museum. And this is something that you're always grappling with. What is the level of intervention that is appropriate? The architectural vision, um, the kind of things that you would expect and we hope that we have realized, but the last of which was to prove Jacques Gaudibert wrong. The challenges, um, as you can see, um, extensive. I'll let you just cruise through them because when I think of what the challenges were, I like to look the other direction. But one of the things that really interested us was how do we reinforce the building to uh, withstand earthquakes and how do we deal with the sinking castle because it was still sinking. What I'm showing you here are some of the early plans that we prepared that illustrated the design proposals. I won't go through them in detail, but it included an addition to the south so that the museum would have a great back of house with loading docks and conservation areas and a greenhouse. And of course, one might ask, why do you have this lantern? What's the point of the, of the tower? And uh, the uh, vision behind this was that it was born of three main purposes. One was strictly functional. We had to find a place to put in a whole new stair system because the building was never really designed to have the public come to all the levels. It was only to come to the second level. And they ad hoc it over the decades. And so to create a stair system, like the butterfly stair that you see, which I hope you all go up and down, um, we didn't want to put something like that in the exhibit spaces because those were reserved for exhibits. So the idea of uh, extending or recreating the tower for the stair system was a functional reason. The second was to reinstate the wonderful symmetry that you had had as you came along Metcalf Street and you had the, the symbol of the museum on the axis of Metcalf. And thirdly, the museum wanted to show that this wasn't a castle. It was a museum of natural history and to create a kind of transparent showcase of what was in the museum. And those things drove the, uh, the creation of the, of, the, of the lantern. A few details here, you see on the right, two different versions of how the atrium paint color should be, uh, should be treated. On the right hand side, one of our ideas was to do something dramatic, paint it all red. And the other one was to go back to the historic colors that it had through paint analysis. Uh, in the end, the historic version prevailed and construction started. Here are some amazing photos of the building that you're in right now during the construction stage. It was an aggressive, uh, we, we gutted everything in the building and discovered that some of the footings had failed because of the building sinking. And uh, here's more of the interior. Nature's Cafe, when you go down there, this is how it looked. And then, of course, the whole idea of reinforcing the building to withstand earthquakes. And Dan Carson, sitting at the back here, was uh, one of the authors of this system, which was basically to install a steel birdcage inside the, the building against the exterior walls in order for them to support the outside walls. And there are examples of this in, in the building as we, as we did it. I'm going to move more quickly here. At this point here, I just want to show you how easy it is to put in seismic frames in the building. You just drop them down from the roof. Everybody's having a good time. Load them on little carts. This is 
why this is a fun job. And away they go. Imagine going to work every day and seeing that. <laughs> when a building sinks, you sometimes get a few cracks. These were the serious cracks in the building. And uh, to repair all of these cracks, you had to go through the asbestos plaster. Not, a, not an easy job, very tricky. And um, work inside. What's this? A bison. Well, we had to move the mammals gallery, and the mammals were, of course, in these wonderful dioramas. And we had one year of debate about, because the dioramas were bigger than the archway that went into the atrium, do you cut the building up so you can move the dioramas, which were a piece of art, or do you cut the dioramas in half and run them through the... Uh, through the, the, the doorways. One year we had a debate on this. Eventually it was agreed that we would cut the dioramas and then repair them afterwards. And when you go to the mammals gallery, what I want you to do is to study all of the dioramas and see if you can find the seam. You can't. It's beautifully done. The lantern itself was an amazing uh, uh, challenge. And uh, some of the drawings and models that we did because we could not, and this is a Dan Carson thing, Dan, you can come in at any time here if you like, uh, the soils were overstressed so that we could not load anything on the former base of the tower. So it had to be light, like glass, and also we had to find a way to build this lantern without uh, putting any load on the outside walls. So first there were concrete piers there at the bottom, and then the elevator shafts that you probably used in the elevator cab when you came up. And then we had to then install the columns that, are, uh, that you see when you go up the butterfly stairs. And then after that, the stairs themselves installed. And then a truss between the two towers. And then a cantilevered roof truss. And then all the glass you see was hung from the roof. And this is something that I think that you wouldn't necessarily realize when you got there. But what I wanted to show you now is that this glass was um, fabricated in, uh, in Liverpool. And what I'd just like to show you here is a little video about the production of the glass. It just happened that I was on holiday, Evelyn and I were on holidays in England visiting my daughter, and uh, it was suggested to me that I go to the uh, Pilkington Glassworks in Liverpool just as a visit. It turned out that they were manufacturing the glass for the lantern as we were there. We quickly got together a, uh, a little film team uh, led by my filmmaker daughter, who was available at a moment's notice and does what her dad says. And so we got the uh, making of the lantern and the glass as a little documentary film that uh, helps to really let us appreciate what we see and how things are made. One of the things that struck me about being in this factory is that the people that you see working here on it, four or five, that's all there were on the factory floor of about you know, 10 acres. It's hugely, hugely mechanized and uh, it was really quite a treat. And they didn't know what the glass was that they were producing. And when I was introduced as one of the architects from Ottawa and I showed them some pictures, of where this glass was going to go, they were inspired. And so it was a really a great, uh, a great story to be 
able to convey a little bit of Canada to the people in Liverpool that were uh, uh, working in this last factory. It certainly gave me an appreciation for the workmanship, not that I understood anything that they said. For those of you who work in government, uh, the idea of doing this documentary film was something where we thought, if we go back to public works or to the museum to get a budget and approval for a film like this, We'll never get it, it'll be too late. So we just were renegades and we just went ahead and made it. And so here's the glass being shipped to Canada. And when you go out and or experience the lantern, it'll give you a sense of uh, uh, some of the stories that we have in every building, which I hope we appreciate. The reason for letting you see the credits here is really to let you know how many people and how many skills were involved in a renovation project like this. Not just the engineering and architectural side, all the conservators, but the constructors and all the trades that were part of it. And uh, when we really did the count of this, it's something that was quite um, awesome. Then a few more of the construction pictures, just to let you know how amazing it was. And another little time lapse here that I think you might like to see as well. This is how the lantern was actually built. Again, very easy. We set up a camera on the balcony of an apartment building for six months and uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands, millions of slides uh, taken and this is a little clip. If you want to see the long version sometime, we can certainly bore you with that. And the cost of setting up on this, uh, uh, on this balcony was, I think, about two bottles of excellent wine because the, uh, <laughs> the apartment was, the owner was, uh, was an engineer and he was really intrigued by the project. So, with this, I'm going to bring this little presentation to a close with um, a few views of the space complete which you can visit. Uh, on the left, you can see the stair that uh, leads up beside, just behind the atrium, where we've left the steel that reinforces the building to withstand earthquakes uh, as a public display so that it helps us understand uh, and a view here from the uh, crane bucket by our, one of our team, Eric Fruhoff, who had the guts to go up on the crane and take this photograph. And uh, then the building complete and the grand opening in 2010 which was really quite a relief and uh, an excitement for us. And opening day. It was a nice day, it didn't rain. And it was really quite rewarding after all these years of work in uh, an empty place uh, where all we did was solve problems and imagine the future to really see it from the perspective of the public and uh, as, we, as we can today. We've got an extra bottle of wine for that one, that's right. 
And of course, seeing the building filled with people, with the kind of spaces that I find quite awesome, and I hope you appreciate them as well, with all the new exhibits, Dinosaur Gallery and uh, Nature's Cafe, the Salon, and I was talking with somebody just a bit earlier from Georgian Bay, and the floors in the Salon were, uh, it's an oak wood, that uh, the whole of the museum had oak floors and we had to take them all up in order to do the seismic reinforcement, but many of them, uh, we took the nails out. I personally took one nail out, I think. And uh, they were laid back down again and uh, the, uh, I just learned that the company that did the, uh, the wood still exists or is, uh, is still there which was another piece of, of interesting history for me. So this is the completion of my uh, short story here about the museum and uh, a few additional views of it as we go along here. And of course, in the end of June of uh, 2010, we of course had Queen Elizabeth II who named the, uh, the lantern the Queen's Lantern. Queen as in Queen plural, being Queen Elizabeth and her predecessor, Queen Victoria. A little bit of the planning of the site, because there is some unfinished business, and that is that there is a master plan that was created to return the nine acres of uh, Appen Place to being a museum park. Right now you see parking on the uh, east and west side and uh, I think that it's something that uh, still needs to happen in order to make this building uh, restored to its grandeur in a setting that is uh, what, what it deserves. So with that, uh, sorry I kept you too long, but uh, you can see how enthusiastic I can be. Well, thank you so much for that talk, Barry. That was fascinating. Uh, I've been coming to this museum since I was nine years old, and my granddaughters love it every time they're here from out of town, practically. Uh, so on behalf of the uh, Ontario Heritage Conference, I want to thank you for this presentation this evening, uh, give you a small token of the uh, conference's appreciation. And uh, we, uh, we have another 15 minutes or so for conversation, and uh, I hope you've had your coffee. Uh, if anyone has questions for Barry, I'm sure he'd be glad to either answer them from the podium, if, they're, if, if you like, or, or uh, better, probably one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and uh, we'll see you back at City Hall first thing tomorrow morning. <laughs>